Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 5th of July 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is Fate of the World, which is a card based game about saving the world from inevitable environmental destruction. I'm pretty rubbish at it. In fact, I think most people are. This game is not easy. This is the first scenario, the tutorial scenario, and I'm still losing. This one comes in from Kopaka99 that says, Lately there have been a lot of games coming out with single player campaigns with long storylines and a lot of gameplay. E.g. The Witcher 2, Infamous 2, Crisis 2, etc. Now I've played some of these and I've noticed that they are significantly larger than some past games. I'm not saying that's bad. Valve pulled off Half-Life and got several awards, but some of the games coming out lately have been rather long and somewhat tedious. Am I just being picky or is it true? What are your thoughts on the matter? This is the exact opposite to what people were saying months ago, that, oh, games are too short these days, oh god, Call of Duty has a three-hour campaign, etc. To be honest, it's good that there are choices in terms of getting games that actually last for a while. I mean, Witcher 2 is fairly long, Crisis 2 I wouldn't call all that long, I mean, it's about 10 to 12 hours maximum, which I suppose is long in comparison to a lot of single-player FPS these days, but... Really, in comparison to past FPS, not even close. It took way longer to get through Quake, Doom, Wolfenstein, things like that, than it did to get through Crisis 2. And Crisis 2 is one of the lengthier FPS these days. You've got loads of FPS coming out, like Homefront, like Call of Duty, that actually have four-hour campaigns, which is not what I would call amazing. And they only have four-hour campaigns because half of that is caught up in scripted events. I mean, really, if you could run through all the levels not impeded by this nonsense, you'd probably beat it in an hour and a half, if that. So, I'm fairly glad that we're getting some games with some actual substance to them. And when it comes to The Witcher 2, you couldn't possibly have expected that to be a short game. I mean, The Witcher certainly wasn't. It's a single-player RPG. And there are comparable and indeed longer games than that. For God's sake, Dragon Age Origins takes, if you get everything in the game, about 100 hours to beat. That's one playthrough without the DLC. So consider that. And then you've got games like Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dell, Neverwinter Nights that have massively long campaigns as well. And those are, of course, much older titles. It's good. It's good that they're there. I think it comes down to pacing, though. And what you're talking about, well, it, the game gets tedious. Well, that seems to me a problem with design. and It's got nothing to do with the length. It comes down to, is this game spread out? And there's been some complaints about Alice Madness Returns, for instance, that that game is very padded and the game experience is spread out over a very long period of time and it becomes extremely tedious as a direct result of that. But a properly paced game, yeah, that can go on for as long or as short as it likes. And for instance, the original Portal is not a very long game, but people praised it for being a perfectly paced game. It was exactly as long as it needed to be, and no shorter and no longer than that. It was properly paced, you never felt like it was dragging on, and you never felt that it was rushing you at any point. So that's what it really comes down to. Is the game well designed in such a way that you can be interested in it for the length of time that the campaign is going to take to complete? If that is not the case, then you've done it wrong. And if it's the case of, well, I'm really, really interested and this ended way too soon, then you've also done it wrong. So it is something to consider when designing your particular game. Whether it be five hours or 50 hours, the game's got to stay interesting. If it doesn't, well, you've done something wrong. This one comes in from Enrique that says, As you might know by now, the press version of Deus Ex Human Revolution was leaked about a month ago. It's got me thinking, if a preview version of a game, something that was never meant to be sold, gets leaked, is it wrong to download it to give it a try? Leaks of this nature vary wildly from case to case, and some of them it can be almost the whole game. But I mean, when it's a portion of it, or a very early build. Personally, I think it's okay to get a hands-on feel of what the final product might be, and with plenty of developers not providing demos of their games, it's sometimes the only way to do so without downright pirating. What is your take on the subject? That's an interesting one. There's a couple of problems with people getting a hold of preview builds, because they will often spread not so much misinformation, but a lot of people don't really understand what a preview build actually is. And as a direct result of that, the information that they then give out, because of course they can't stop running their mouths about it on the internet, can be very, very harmful. That's the problem. That's why nobody wants preview builds leaked to the public, if you happen to be a publisher or a developer. Nobody wants that. I'm trying to think of any deliberate leaks. I'm not coming up with any. Not in recent memory. Some people have said that, hey, that was the deliberate leak. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> really, it isn't. The thing about marketing a game is that it's all about control of the message and control of the information that gets to people. And if you release a big press-only demo that no doubt came with a 
ton of documentation in the process saying, this is what you have to bear in mind. I've had a few preview builds before, and usually they come with quite a lot of documentation. They come with reviewing guides. They come with instructions. They come with things that are wrong with the games. Like, right, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. This problem right here. This is what you need to get past this bit, etc., etc. And a person in the press, a professional reviewer, understands this and will treat it accordingly. Your average dude on the internet probably won't, and as such will actually spread bad things about the game. They make wild assumptions about how good the game should be at a certain stage in the development. That's why releasing those things are generally not such a good idea. As regards to whether or not it's piracy, well, it, again, it's technically copyright infringement, yes, but is it harmful? Probably not. And personally, I'm not going to download Deus Ex Human Revolution. I want to play the full product when it's out because I love Deus Ex. You know, I want to experience it in the best way possible and get a good, honest impression. I don't want to sour my impressions by playing an incomplete preview build. That doesn't make any sense. You know, that's like looking at a piece of artwork before it's been finished. And there's a reason why artists don't want you to see it until the final product is done. There's a reason why developers don't want you to see it before the final product is done. It's up to you, really. I mean, you're probably not going to get in trouble for it, but once again, I have to state a little bit of a caveat there that you can. It is very possible that you can get in trouble for it one way or the other, but who's to say? It is technically, legally wrong. Is it morally wrong? Well, probably not. Honestly. And it comes down to a personal decision. Do you want to spoil the game before you get into it? Because, for instance, with Revolution, it's a very, very long piece of preview build. To the point where I would not want to play it because I don't want to play that section again and have all the surprise ruined. I want to be able to play the full thing. I don't want to, I don't want to have anything spoiled at all. I've actually been avoiding watching a lot of trailers for that very reason. I don't want to know about the storyline. I don't want to know about these things. Please don't spoil it. So, there you go. It's up to you. Just for God's sake, if you do get it, don't go on the internet whining about all the bugs and how it's a broken game or whatever. There's a load of stuff to fix. It's by no means representative of the final product at all. This one comes in from Lars that says, I'm a long-time fan. I often hear you talk about games being DRM-free or DRM-restricted. Now, I know that this is usually a discussion forum, but I was wondering if you could explain what DRM does to a game. It might be the case that I'm the only person who calls himself an active gamer, but still doesn't know what this means. But still, I was wondering if you could enlighten me and maybe others as to what effects it can have on certain games. I've tried looking around the internet. I've not been able to find someone that could explain DRM in layman's terms. Well, we might as well get it out there, I suppose. Some people don't understand it. We can talk about the wider implications as well. DRM is digital rights management, and the point of DRM is to prevent piracy. It's as simple as as that, or to try and prevent piracy. There has been no DRM system that has been 100% effective in preventing piracy, and the debate right now is DRM versus consumer rights, because you're getting increasingly intrusive DRM that makes demands of the consumer and restricts what he can do with the product, and that is fighting against the whole idea that piracy is hurting the industry and we must take all possible measures to protect ourselves from this. Therein lies the problem. For the most part, the problem with restrictive DRM is that it stops certain people from actually playing the game that they legitimately bought. One of the most heinous examples in history for DRM was Star Force. Now, Star Force is not used anymore, as far as I'm aware. And if there is a game that uses Star Force, my god, why are you doing that? Star Force was very intrusive, to the point where it was very difficult to remove from the machine. It would install programs which were effectively malware into the machine, which was not so great. And what you'd also also have is a system that would overzealously check whether or not you had things like CD burners or virtual drives, which of course have plenty of completely legitimate uses, and it would stop you from playing the game if you did. I mean, an example would be Star Force would actually thrash the disc a lot of the time, and it would, if it detected any inconsistencies, including scratches or smudges on the disc, would absolutely refused to play. People complained that the drives that were installed in order for Star Force to actually work were causing system instability and crashes and things like that. Not to mention some crazy drama in 2006 where an employee of the company actually posted a link to a torrent search engine for Galactic Civilizations 2, which was a game released by Stardock with no DRM, as a demonstration of what a lack of prevention can lead to. Absolutely ridiculous, and of course they had to apologize for that one. But yeah, Star Force was very, very unpopular indeed, and I can hardly blame people for that. 
And that's what it comes down to. The most recent DRM systems that have been criticized the most have been to do with being consistently online. You might remember I was talking recently about Assassin's Creed 2. Ubisoft for a while used a system whereby if you were playing a game on PC, you had to be connected to the internet at all times. What would then happen is if you lost your internet connection, you would be forced back to the previous checkpoint and it would freeze your game in the course of play and you wouldn't be able to do anything with it. Now, when Assassin's Creed 2 came out, if I recall correctly, the servers were actually DDoSed, which means that people that legitimately bought the game couldn't play it, whereas those who had pirated it, well, they didn't have so much of a problem. Now, Ubisoft has pulled back from that recently, which is good, and you won't find all that many companies that use a system like that anymore because there was a massive backlash. What people need to understand about protection systems in DRM is they're not designed to stop piracy altogether. They're designed to delay it long enough that the people that would have considered pirating it get bored and then just go and buy it. Yeah. Hardcore pirates will always find a way. You cannot stop them, and there is no point investing money in trying. And a lot of companies are starting to realize that. So what DRM targets is the casual market whereby they might be tempted to torrent it if it was available on day one, or even worse, beforehand. Now, I can understand that, and there are some DRM systems that are reasonably fair, but for the most part, you'll find that DRM does cause problems for the consumer in one way or the other, even if it's a very, very tiny piece of inconvenience, all the way through to, I cannot play your game at all, or it crashed my system, or whatever the case. Steam, for instance, is a form of DRM. You might notice that there are many games that you cannot play without being logged into Steam. Anything that Steam works, works that way. So that is in itself a form of digital rights management, but a lot of people seem to be okay with that. Personally, I'm a little bit um and ah on it, because I've had problems with Steam before, whereby it's just not let me play the games that I legitimately owned. And that, to me, is extremely frustrating. Now, to me, it seems like DRM is here to stay, and it's not going to go anywhere, and as much as I absolutely adore companies like say, CD Projekt, that released Witcher 2 DRM free, we also saw just how many copies of Witcher 2 were pirated on day one as a direct result of that. Some people just plain suck, it's as simple as that, and there's not an awful lot you can do about that, unfortunately. And I'm happy that CD Projekt didn't come out and say, well, we regretted this, we're not going to be doing that in the future, because a bunch of freeloaders decided they didn't want to purchase this game, which was great value for money and a massive support of the PC as a platform. And people like that do need to be slapped around the face. A DRM would be less of an issue, and I think the companies would go less crazy trying to do it if gamers would just actively turn around and say, look, if you actually pirate games like this that are good quality, that are supportive of the community, and where the developer and the publisher have actually extended an olive branch and said, look, okay, we're going to trust you because you're our consumers, and we're going to try and treat you right. If gamers actually turned around and actively went after people that decided just to pirate that anyway and made it a socially unacceptable thing, then I suppose they could reduce it. They can't get rid of it, though. And they shouldn't try to, either. Piracy is a really thorny subject. In general, yes, piracy is wrong. You should not be taking a product that you are asked to pay for. That said, it goes into these murky waters, these very murky waters of the idea that, oh, well, I wasn't going to buy it anyway. And uh, it's a horrible wrench in the argument because you can never argue that. You can't see inside the guy's head. You don't know if that guy was actually going to tell the truth. But I think it comes down to entitlement. It's like, well, oh, I wasn't going to buy it anyway. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're entitled to it. <laughs> like, oh, well, I wasn't going to buy it anyway. So on the budget sheet, it doesn't matter. But that doesn't mean you're entitled to it. Good God. Entitlement complex of some games is absolutely absurd, and again, these are the kind of things that do encourage the promotion of more intrusive DRM methods, and we don't like that. As consumers, we should certainly stand up against that to some degree, and we did in the past. You know, we boycotted Assassin's Creed 2, and things got changed there, and there are a couple of other examples, particularly when Star Force was all the rage. A lot of games with Star Force did get boycotted, and with good reason. I did the same thing back in the day. But yeah, that's DRM for you. It is digital rights management. It is copy protection. And you should go and read up on a few systems like Tegas and Secure ROM to find out exactly what they will do because it will inform your purchasing decisions. All right, that's me done for the mail. So let's go and have a look at the Steam deals for today. These should be available until tomorrow at 
6 p.m. BST, that's 7 p.m. CEST, that would be 1 p.m. Eastern Standard, you can work it out from there. So, kicking off right now with Civilization 5, 50% off. I believe this is much cheaper if you get a boxed version, and bear in mind that it is a Steamworks game. So if you have a look on Amazon, chances are you will find it cheaper. Civ 5 has had a mixed reception, and honestly, I didn't pay a huge amount of attention to it. I did buy it on launch and then barely played it. I played a ton of Civ 4, and of course, I loved Alpha Centauri, much, much older Sid Meier game, but... Yeah, I, I don't know, I just wasn't enthused by this one. I don't know what it is. I just It felt stale, I think. And I don't really like the city-states mechanic either. I don't think it really works all that much, and I'm sick of begging some weak little nations, like, oh, come and join us. I'm just going to throw gold at you until you do. It reminded me of the diplomacy system in Birth of the Federation, which wasn't particularly good either. Not a huge fan overall. As I said, it's got very mixed opinions from people. Personally, I would say if you've never played Civilization before, grab Civilization 4 and Civilization 4 Beyond the Sword. That is an absolutely fantastic collection, and there are plenty of mods available for that as well. Civ 5, not so much, and obviously the fact that they are also selling the Civilizations as DLC... Not too much of a fan of that one either. They didn't really give you a huge choice in the base game, so... It did seem like they came out thinking, we're just going to add them on as DLC, and I don't really like that attitude. Beat Hazard, 75% off. Oh, yes, you've seen Beat Hazard before. It's been in the background of not one, but two of my mailbox videos. And the add-on pack, Beat Hazard Ultra, is also 75% off. My God, get it. It's so much fun. Just remember that you might get blinded by it. It's probably not ideal for those who are sensitive to flashing strobe-like effects, but it is a wonderful, wonderful game, and it's got a lot going for it. I am a huge fan, especially with the Ultra Pack. AI War, 85% off. This is highly underrated, and you guys suck for not buying it. I'm sorry, you do. I People who complain that there aren't enough big strategy games anymore, there aren't enough big RTS, kind of like Supreme Commando and things like that. This is one of those games, and not a lot of people bought it, and they need to be slapped around the face for that. Come on, take this opportunity. It is a really unique game. It's kind of like a mixture of Supreme Commander in space with a little bit of tower defense, and it has a very, very unique AI system, whereby the AI in the game actually acts like a malevolent computer entity. It is designed around co-op versus the AI, but you can play it solo. It's perfectly serviceable in that regard. There are also three expansions with tons of new units and crazy things to discover. It's, it's nuts. I mean, this game has so much content. It's unbelievable. If you can get past the initial learning curve, and of course the tutorial and the graphics are a lot better because Arson Games continue to update their software well after release because they just support their games really well. And it costs you basically nothing. So for God's sake, try AI War. If there's anything in this collection of games today that I say you must try that is incredibly unique and awesome that you will never, ever find anywhere else, I AI War, please do get AI War and pick up the expansions as well because they cost basically nothing. Guild Wars Trilogy, yes, that's Guild Wars Factions and Eye of the North, as well as Nightfall. I don't know if it's really worth buying Guild Wars now, honestly, but it's still a really solid game. There's a lot of enjoyment to be had from it. If you've never tried it before, it it's not a free-to-play game per se, it's just it's a subscription-free game. And MMO-wise, pretty much everything is instanced. So it's kind of like playing Diablo, I suppose, and going into various servers there. But there are communal town areas as well as larger-scale PvP. It is a good game. It's a really, really good game for what it is. It is a hotkey MMO for all intents and purposes. It's got really good PvP, so it might be something to look into if you're really bored. Admittedly, I don't know if you can really justify the price for a game that old, but hey, if that's what you're after, you could certainly do worse. Monday Night Combat, 75% off. This game is an awesome, awesome third-person shooter. It is a multiplayer, class-based third-person shooter with a great sense of humor, fantastic graphics, and a lot of variety. It's kind of like a tower defense game mixed with Team Fortress 2, so you build towers and and you try and defend your money ball from AI robots that are spawned on the other side. So it is a little weird in that regard. And I like it a lot. It's got a lot of character to it. I did a WTF is of it. You can go and check it out if you want to find out more about Monday Night Combat. 75% off is a good price. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. This is worth having for one reason. They've just released that Galactic Warfare mod, the Star Wars one. 
Funnily enough, Call of Duty 4 has a really good multiplayer scene still because, of course, it had servers and there's lots of modding going on for it. The single player was pretty good as well. Until things started to go really downhill with Modern Warfare 2. So, I mean, Call of Duty 4 is a good game. It really, really is. I would recommend giving it a try if you've never played it before. Admittedly, I don't know if this is a great price for it, but it's probably the best price you'll see in a while. And as I said, it's got an active modding scene. And that Star Wars mod looks kick-ass, so it might be worth a shot. King Arthur, franchise sale, yes, this is all 85% off, so you can get King Arthur with all of the DLC. King Arthur's kind of like a mixture of Rome and medieval Total War, with RPG and text adventure elements. It's kind of weird like that, but it is oddly compelling. It's got a great setting to it, it's got good graphics, although what I would say is that the battles, particularly in the first few hours of the game, are rather dull. They're nowhere near as tactical as, say, they are in the Total War games, and they lack the impact as well. The animation quality isn't quite up there. But it has a lot of cool, unique elements. It's got a alignment system and stuff like that, and it's got magic in it as well. So you've got heroes that can cast spells. It's, it's pretty unique, and for that price, it's certainly worth a look, in my honest opinion. Deus Ex, Game of the Year edition, 75% off. Now, curiously, they said this is a franchise sale, but I don't remember there being another Deus Ex game. Do you? No? People keep saying, oh, what about Invisible War? But I'm fairly sure that game didn't exist, so I don't really know what they're talking about. Oh, yes, Deus Ex Game of the Year Edition. Why do you not own this game? Buy this game, buy this game, buy this game. If you need to know why, go and watch my 250,000 subscriber video. Yeah, I do a fairly long thing on Deus Ex. Shift 2 Unleashed. This is actually a franchise sale for Need for Speed, available in packs. Otherwise, they're 40% off each. Hot Pursuit is pretty good, but badly optimized for PC. That's what I found at the time. It ran like crap on a system that, as far as I'm concerned, should do much, much better. Undercover, I have heard nothing about, so I don't even want to judge it. Shift and Shift 2 are attempts at making a more realistic game, although the complaints that I've had about Shift 2 are that it's not hardcore enough to please the racing fans that are into Sims, and it's not casual enough to please everybody else. So it's in this weird, awkward spot. And they're not bad games in and of themselves, but each of them has their own unique problems, so perhaps you might want to avoid those for the time being, unless you're really big into races. The Stalker franchise, 75% off. These games are fantastic. If you want to pick up any of them, I would get maybe Shadow of Chernobyl and Call of Pripyat. Avoid Clear Sky. Clear Sky is the cheapest, but it's also the worst. It is not particularly good unless you mod the crap out of it. Call of Pripyat is the least buggy of the three, and these are open-world RPG FPS games, and they are very cool at what they do. They are creepy, they are fairly scary, there's a lot to do, there's a big open world to explore, and the modding scene for them is really good. For instance, the complete mod for Shadow of Chernobyl makes it much, much better, and they're working on stuff for Call of Pripyat as well. Personally, the one I enjoyed the most was Call of Pripyat, and if I were to go for any of them and not buy the whole lot, I would get that. You don't really need to have played the previous games to understand them, although playing Shadow of Chernobyl is fairly helpful. It, you'll pick up a few things, but you can easily play Call of Pripyat without having done that. You're not the same character in it anyway. Ah, yes, Monkey Island, the special edition. Now, this is a good discount for both of these. You can actually pick them both up as a limited time offer for 50% off each. There's a special edition bundle that gives you that, and this is Monkey Island 2 and Secret of Monkey Island special edition. They've been remastered with great new voice acting as well as new graphics. If you're looking for classic point-and-click action, look no further. Both the Monkey Island games are absolutely stellar. Wings of Prey, 85% off. This is, this is kind of like the need for speed shift of flight sims. Bear in mind, these are the guys that brought you IL-2 Stormovich, which was a fairly hardcore sim, and then you got Wings of Prey, which is a bit more consolified. It is a beautiful game. I had problems with my joystick because it wouldn't actually sync up properly for whatever reason. I don't really know why that is. I would like to say I've had a lot of chance to try it out, but I really haven't. I've owned it, but I haven't really touched it all that much. It has reasonable reviews, and I would recommend having a look through those to see if this is the kind of thing you're looking for. That said, in recent memory, it is most certainly one of the best arcade-ish flight sims. We're not going to talk about Hawks 2. Ugh, I'm just going to try and scrub that from my mind. And I believe that covers it all, in fact. Yep, that would be all of the daily deals. Thank you very much for watching the show today. Have fun with your purchases, and I will see you next time.